yeah, so uh, welcome back. I'm delighted to be joined by Yo Min Park, who is a North Korean defector and human rights activist. Um, she's the author of In Order to Live, A North Korean Girl's Journey to Freedom. And she also has a very popular YouTube channel called um, Voice of North Korea by Yo Min Park. I'll put a link to that in the bottom. And it's interesting because you do quite serious stuff. So, um, you know, about the treatment of North Korean women in, in China, for example. But you also do sort of softer stuff like, you know, what's dating culture like in North Korea? How does it vary from America? Uh, I thought that was quite an interesting choice. Um, was that kind of a deliberate thing to mix up the serious stuff and the, and the less serious stuff? Yeah, I think when I began my activism as a human rights activist, I realized that human rights wasn't something that accessible or it wasn't as interesting subject for young people especially it was more like very serious at the UN you know so I feel like I want to make the human rights a bit more accessible and humanizing subject to the younger people as well so therefore and also when the traditional like uh, media coverage in North Korea is very rigid yeah. it's all about like crazy dictator the nuclear weapons and usually that's all about it. And however, they don't really show the human side of North Korea. And I really wanted to tell people that there are like 25 million people living like us there. They get married, they eat, they date, you know, they have dreams. And I just really wanted to show the human side of North Korea. Growing up in North Korea, I mean, kind of how much awareness did you have of the outside world? Did you, did you know Did you know that it was quite an unusual country, or I, I guess it just seemed normal to you at the time? So it is a, I did not even see the, see the map of the world. <sighs> Therefore, I never even knew what Africa was, what, you know, Canada was. I never knew what continents were. And in North Korea, they teach us, they don't teach us that we're Asians. Instead, they, they teach us that we are Kim Il-sung race. So Kim Il-sung people, that's what they call. So I thought I was Kim Il-sung race. I never thought I was like an East, East Asian woman. <laughs> and, you know, our calendar obviously begins when Kim Il-sung was born. So that's like when we call like Ju Taewon and the, the Western calendar begins when Jesus Christ was born. So, you know, North Korea's time was very different. It's like almost like having a different common law, like it's very different planet. They have like different way of thinking about the world. I mean, I read the um, kind of some of the younger generations, so I, I think you're 27, is that? Mm -hmm. uh, you left when you were 13. Mm -hmm. um, but the, some of the black markets become much more important for the younger generation. Um, and the you know, North Korean economy is ever so slightly opened up because of it. Um, you know, maybe not through choice. Mm -hmm. um, was that how you came in contact with Western stuff or, or, or even, you know, non-North Korean stuff? So you've got like your South Korean um, dramas that are quite popular out there, I, I, I've read. Yeah, that's a very good question. These, uh, after 90s, during the North Korea experiences great famine in the 90s, like more than 3 million people died and the regime was stopped providing any ration to people. And only way people could survive was during, through the smuggling through China. And with, with that smuggling, this outside information came in. And like that, myself, you know, I watched the movie called Titanic. And that really like gave me some taste of freedom. However, even though I was watching this foreign information with my friends, it wasn't like we could have internet and go in and what's going on in the world. It was really like looking at Titanic myself was, I remember how confused I was. I couldn't like conceive why anyone would make a movie out of such a shameful story. You know, in school, we don't learn about like Shakespeare. We don't know who's Romeo and Juliet is. Everything that we learn is about, you know, propaganda. Yeah. So even though this house of information is opening up North Korea's young generation eyes, however, their understanding of the world is very still like very limited. Much better than before though. Yeah, because when we think of kind of North Korean propaganda in the West, obviously we're thinking of you know, the mass parades and the you know, huge pictures of Kim Il Sung and Kim Jong Un, etc. Um, I mean, is, is that how it actually kind of comes across in reality, or was it somehow subtle and a, a bit cleverer when you're actually living through it? So, how the regime does a proper machine us, you mean? Yeah, exactly. It is way now. I'm thinking about it. How. 
I mean, the reason why it worked is because they were able to completely block in the outside information. You know, there is only one channel on TV and every program that has to be verified the regime. And even that one channel doesn't start like a whole day. It starts at 5 p.m. in the evening and ends at midnight. But most people don't even have 24 hours of electricity. So can't even get to watch that propaganda. And only the one newspaper, and that is only for the elite. There's none sorts of like, so every song, every movie, every book they write is all about propaganda. Therefore, like imagine if you put a child in a cage and from rest of the things, that person's gonna only know what's in that cage. Like what is it, the Plato's that, you know, the dilemma in the cage is almost like similar like that. They're just putting in that cage and do not show anything to them. And then it's so easy to brainwash them and form their minds and thoughts. How effective do you think it is? Do you think sort of the average North Korean thinks that Kim Jong-un is a great man or you know, do, do they have their doubts but they don't want to wear them publicly because you know, they know what the consequences would be? So I think when the first two kings were very powerful, they were like almighty God to us. Even though after my escape, I was afraid to even think because I, I learned, you know, the kings were able to read my thoughts. What North Korean regime did was copying the Bible. So, you know, in Christian God, they said, like, God knows what you think, how many hair in your head, like, head, you gotta sacrifice for the God's kingdom. And Jesus died, but his body died, but his spirit is with us forever. That's what North Korea tells us, the regime, like, Kim Jong il died, but his spirit is there with us forever and ever. Yeah, North Korea is a religion, one of the really tiny religions in the world. They copy the religion and they copy the Bible. Therefore, people were, I mean, actually genuinely believed that they were gods. But however, after Kim Jong-un, the latest Kim came in, it's been shifting way more because uh, this influx of outside information going in and tell people actually Kim's go to the bathroom. <laughs> they cry, they're like humans. They are not like gods can move the mountains and do miracles anymore. So more people and more people now in North Korea are realizing the force of this propaganda. Yeah. I mean, do you think kind of the popularity of the regime has changed since Kim Jong-un took over? Is he less popular than some of his predecessors, do you think? Oh yeah, way, way less popular. Because, I mean, Kim Il sung time, at least in the beginning when he was trying this socialism thing out in the 60s, North Korea was doing better than South Korea. So, but afterwards, of course, it's going down here, right, for sure. And people were still fond of that, like, 10-year period when they were good. And then Kim Jong-il time, it was still like he was buying off from his father's image. And then Kim Jong-il keep promising to North Korean people that if you suffer with me until 2012, we are gonna go into socialist paradise, the utopia. However, in 2012, nothing happened and he was dead. So, you know, that people were suffering until 2012 and that utopia didn't come and they just don't believe it anymore. So Kim Jong-un definitely has been hard time to convince North Koreans that he, he's the almighty God and he's the only one who can take them to the, you know, socialist paradise. Yeah. I mean, there's been a lot of reports about just how ruthless um, he's been. I mean, do, do you think that's partly because he lacks the kind of the popular support that some of his predecessors perhaps at least had a little bit of? So you mean the challenge to Kim Jong-un right now? Yes. Uh -huh. I think it's moving forward, like, Almost because the North Korean system has this like very zero tolerance to anyone who dissents. Yeah. You never you never see like there's IRA in China. There are so many distance from China or like Iran, other countries. But you never hear about there's a home arrest in North Korea happening. Right? Because just if that happens, the regime kills you and the resolution of your family get killed. Therefore, I think Kim Jong-un still can maintain it with the absolute horror and terror to people and as long as Chinese regime supports Kim Jong-un, I think it's gonna be very hard to change the regime, unfortunately, because there's so much power in the hands of the care right now and there's really no power in the pen hands of people. So it's just, it's a very uh, saddening situation. 
Tony was to withdraw its support, um, there would actually be a serious chance of danger in North Korea. So, uh, sorry, I'm having a thing. What were you saying? Sorry. If China was to stop backing the regime, there would be a serious chance of change in North Korea. Of course, like all those elites, you know, nobody is safe in Kim Jong Un's reign. Like even his uncle was executed. Even his half brother get assassinated. Nobody is safe, and they all know that. Whenever the new Kims come, they purge these uh, officials, right? I don't know if you read the news. There's a one official who was falling asleep in the, during the meeting and he was executed after him. And like, this is how ruthless dictator is. Like your life is never guaranteed. Like it's, they compare North Korean life as like one fly. You never know how you're gonna die that day. That's how quickly you can go. And even though you're the top official in the top. And, but the thing is the officials cannot start a coup or revolution is because they know who's behind the Kim Jong-un, which is a very powerful Chinese Communist Party backing it up. So even they remove Kim Jong-un, they know that China is not find a way to find another dictator and place him there. So there will be really not much change unless China changes their plan over North Korea. Yeah. It's really impossible to envision the you know, top elites gonna even rise because I mean, they cannot like they might fight against Kim Jong Un, but they are never gonna fight against Chinese Communist Party for sure. Yeah. When um, I mean, you're talking about kind of you know Western movies like Titanic. I mean, if, if you got caught watching that, um, I mean, presumably that would be against the law. But would, would that be punishable? Yeah. The so the the sentence may vary. So if you were watching the movie and then you share it with other people, you can actually even get executed. Oh. And if you just watch it, you will go sent to prison camp. Yeah. And then sometimes they even just like kill you, execute you, because they, they do this thing called a showcase execution. So even though it was a very light crime, they just want to fear other people, just execute you and show the example to others. This is not what happened to you if you watch these films. So it's not always consistent, but definitely heavy punishment if you ever watch foreign information and get caught. And some of the kind of the work camps that you, you hear about, um, and, you know, you, you read about torture and sexual abuse and all that kind of thing. Um, I mean, could you be sent to one of those for just watching a film or, or is that more for kind of active enemies that, or, you know, actively people who plot against the regime? It's just watching the movies and, or enough to go to send to prison camp. It is definitely, absolutely, that's more than enough. I mean, so my understanding is that it was, um, I think your sister escaped first and then you and your mother and father followed. Um, I mean, but, but were, you, were you kind of discussing as a family, you know, can we get out before this? Or was it a huge shock when your sister just um, vanished? So before, it was 2007, uh, when I was like 13 and a few months before, in around March, my sister escaped, but we were talking about it, but however, it wasn't we were trying to escape altogether. We initially thought my sister and I go. And maybe if we go to China, we thought we were going to be adopted by a family or something. We were so naive. Like we did not know how dark the world was. We didn't think there was a human traffickers and selling girls for sexual slavery. We just thought like, oh, because we are young, they might be just giving us some food and maybe adopt us. And if you can just clean their dishes and do housework, they might feed us. That was like our initial thoughts. So we never thought we could escape with our parents. However, I got really sick. So my sister had to escape first along with her friend. Mm -hmm. And then after you, after you discovered she escaped, the whole family had to follow so that you didn't get punished. Is that how it works? Or? After she escaped, only two, three, four days later, we followed. So we, I mean, after we, my mom, and so my sister left on like uh, March 26th uh, from North Korea in 2007. And four days later, my mom and I followed her. And after that, of course, my father, my aunt, everybody was sent to go, were beaten and tortured because we were all disappeared. But because thankfully we were following her right away a few days later, we were like, we, we didn't get tortured. But the rest of the family were tortured because of our escape. Yeah. 
Oh, a bit, a bit because of your sister or because of all of you, you know? I think it's hard to say because my sister escaped and then my mom and my sister also dis- it disappeared. So it could have been all of us or my sister, we don't know. But now because I spoke out here in the West, uh, three generations of my family back in North Korea has been banished. Oh. Yeah, so... Do they think well, they get the family to try and, you know, put you off speaking out, essentially? Mm-hmm. So even though I escaped and came this far, I still do not have the complete freedom to speak out. Yeah. The regime still punishes and trying to silence me. That's really, that's really, really horrible. I mean... In terms of kind of when you escape, so I, I think there's a river along the Chinese North Korean border. Um, do you have to kind of ford that river or you know, swim through it, wade through it? How, how is what, what's the best route to take? Yeah, North Korea is really really cold, especially where I was from. It's called like Hesan in the northern part and had a border across the China. And because I was escaping on March 30th or 31st, so I think 30 or 31st. Uh, we were able to cross the frozen river. Thankfully, we were able to find the spot. Just walk across the ice. Yeah, yeah. So some parts were almost like not frozen, but we were able to go really remote and has a, like the here and has a lot of the shades. So it wasn't like unfrozen yet. So we crossed that that part to go to China. I mean, when you arrived in China, what happened? Were you met by? Um, traffickers or by people that have, you know, by people that have been pre-arranged or did you just have to go and speak to the government? How, how does it work? Yeah, so my sister, I mean, my sister escaped first and my mother and I were escaping together and we were helped by the lady and back then I didn't even know what human trafficker was. She was bribed this, this border guards. So, you know, even if you want to escape from North Korea, you cannot just escape. They are like border guys, 10 meters with a machine gun standing. They're going to shoot you right away. So they had to bribe the guards for sure. And we didn't even think why she was helping us. And just because she was sending us to human traffickers in China. So as soon as we got there in China, uh, I mean, obviously, first thing I was witnessing was my mom being raped in front of me. And they stole my mom for... I think $65, $75. And they sold me uh, like less than $300 because I was a virgin. That's horrible. So appalling. I mean, and so, so this happened as soon as you arrived in China. So you, you, you're still kind of 13 or 14 at this time. Yeah, I was 13 and a half. Mm. Oh, that's, that's absolutely horrible. Um, and I mean, how, how did you escape or, or kind of get out of um, mm-hmm. servitude? So we, I was, a lot happened. Of course, they stored me separately from my mom. So I was separated from everybody. I was a sore to a human trafficker and so many things happened that I was able to find my mom back after some time. And later, after two years being a slave in China, we found a way to go to South Korea, which means we had to cross the Gobi Desert from China to Mongolia by foot. So we walked across the Gobi Desert to Mongolia in 2009 after Beijing Olympic. And then we, up in Mongolia, we were rescued by South Korean uh, embassy people. So we went to South Korea after a few months in Mongolia. There's quite a big community of North Korean kind of distance exiles in, in South Korea. Yeah, there's a huge uh, like community. These are all, like, Almost 30,000 of North Korean defectors in South Korea, but only above like 200 people in the in USA currently. So way less here. <laughs> I heard that some South Korean exiles, um, they, they like to try and get messages to the North Korea. So I think, I think they put things in balloons. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I think sort of they put South Korean TV shows and information about democracy and the, the wider world. Um, and obviously the, the North Korean regime hates this Mm -hmm. I mean do do you think that's a a productive thing that's something which could help yeah the fact the North Korean regime hates it is very productive thing (laughs) I think that's the that's the only indication you can get is like if Kim Jong-un get mad at it that means it's hurting the regime so 
if the North Korean regime wants to go start a war over that information coming in, I think we should do more of that because that information is really liberating North Korean people's minds. Yeah. Do you think that kind of your generation knew, even though you didn't know much about the outside world, you knew slightly more than the generation before you perhaps? Absolutely. I mean, even now, I, I escaped in 2007, and now I work with underground North Korean people inside of North Korea right now. It's a very, very people, I mean, of course, they don't know, like, full democracy, and they don't even know what human rights is, right? I mean, I heard, like, animals' rights for the first time in South Korea. I was so confused. <laughs> and because, like, you know, it's all the concept that we, we invented and we learned. It's not like humans inherently know what human rights is. And so North Koreans, of course, like don't know that far, but they now know that they are, their dictator is not a god and he's not, you know, doing it for the people. He's a selfish dictator and the people are realizing more and more that they were slaves to the regime every day. You're living in America now. Um, now, I mean, we're speaking the day after the election, but mm. I mean, Donald Trump is still the president. Um, and Donald Trump is about the only Western leader in history that I can recall who's said almost favourable things about King Jong-un. Um, I mean, he, he said that they wrote beautiful letters to each other and they fell in love and it was really yeah. quite bizarre. Um, I mean, how does that make you feel as, you know, as someone who's actually suffered under the regime to have, you know, this American billionaire, um, praising the dictator who oppressed so many people? It was very disheartening and, you know, just realizing politics is a game, how it, you know, what a hypocrisy or this thing is. They talk about, even right now living in America where people are obsessed about slavery that happened hundreds of years ago. I was a slave in this century, in this lifetime. And my people right now in China about like 300,000 of them in China, North Korean prefecture women. 300,000? Uh, yeah. Right now in China, about 300,000 North Korean prefectures, most of them women are in China are being sold for a few hundred dollars, a few thousand dollars. I mean, not like 2,000, like 900 dollars right now, you can buy a girl in China who is North Korean. And this is happening right now here, and it's nobody's political interest to fight for it. So they all say they care about justice. They all care about they care about righteousness. And nobody really cares. They just do whatever that gets them vote. And this is like uh, such a disgusting and disheartening uh, new truth that I'm realizing that I used to, you know, hoping the politicians would be better here. I thought like North Koreans, just the kidders were really worst thing and people here really actually care about human beings. And this just realizing it's not, you know. I mean, of course, Trump did that for the all photo ops. It was very fun for him to get all that attention. And even, but that doesn't mean like Biden did anything. So it's not like I'm, I'm hopeful. I think I'm hopeful that people is different. Like as, as I started my YouTube channel, I realized as individuals, how much people care. And I think that's where the hope lies. It's not with really some, you know, politician who's gonna do it, the right thing. You, you, you talked a bit about the corruption problem on your YouTube channel. When does the Chinese government know this is going on, do you think? Of course they do. Oh my gosh. They absolutely know what it is. So North Korea, they, you know, America in the past, they were like slave hunters who would catch a slave, they would get money. And that's what North, the Chinese regime does. They make it the factor hunters so if you catch a North Korean defector, you get money from the government. And then the government catches and they send us back to North Korea to be executed and to be tortured and sent to prison camp. And that is crimes against humanity by according to Geneva Convention. So China cannot just break the international law, but they do it anyway, because I mean, it's China, what can we do, right? It's very powerful communist party. So. They know it very well, and however, nobody is here to dare to challenge it for China right now. Is it Chinese men buying North Korean women? Is that how it normally works? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Among the defectors, 90% of them are women. 
and a lot of them are young girls like myself you know so if not only that like being sold as a sexual slave wasn't even the worst thing could happen to me they were like buying us for the organ traffickings they just buy us for our organs and they compare us in china to pigs so you know they eat pigs and like that they cannibalism they a lot of psychopaths perverts they buy nose can women and do whatever thing they want to do to them so we are like uh we are treated less than pets like our lives are less valuable than puppies right now in china well, that, so that, that sounds absolutely disgusting i mean i mean what, what could people do to help put pressure on the chinese government is that the best way of getting action taken i think it's raising awareness like right now in even in hollywood in, in tradition like in i don't know what's going on in uk but in america the mainstream media of course they don't want to talk they talk about the girls that were captured by Boko Haram. They don't have any problem talking about the girls captured by ISIS or Malala, the Taliban. But, you know, there are so many business interests to, to police Chinese regime and have a China market share. Yeah. So no mainstream media, no main like corporation, none of the organization is coming out to denounce Chinese uh, regimes, you know, crimes against humanity. But we are not the only ones. Like, look at the Tibetans. Look at the Uyghurs, right? Like they are like building concentration camps to send these people who believe in Muslim. So it's not like China is only violating North Korean women's human rights. They're violating like pretty much everybody's rights and still nobody's there to speak up. And that is a problem that lack of awareness. Like, like you, even though you're a journalist yourself, you didn't know the full extent what was happening to North Korean women and like that. It's been just silenced purposefully because of the economic interests, for sure. It's interesting that you mentioned that a lot more women are defectors than men. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, do, do you know why that is? Why, why aren't there are more male North Korean defectors? Yeah, so in North Korean system, uh, they view men as more like important uh, beings. I mean, so if the man escapes, they, uh, they punish the family more severely. So easier for women to escape. But however, the another reason is that if women escape, they usually be bought and going to brothers and being bought by farmers and being there like forced marriage. And but like so it's it's a bit easier for women to survive in China because we are like we can be sexually exploited. However, there are men, they really hard to survive. They do go like physical, like mining, but it's very hard to survive, even those jobs hard to find. So therefore, if they are men, it's hard to survive in China. And there's more, more punishment to the family members if they escape. Therefore, most of them are majority of them are women. Once you'd left North Korea, so I mean, first in China, then obviously Mongolia and, and South Korea, and, and now the USA. I mean, how shocked by you were, were you by what life was like outside North Korea? Was it kind of what you expected? Or was it, was it very radically different? I mean, you, you, you mentioned animal rights or something, but, um, you know, you weren't expecting. It was like a beyond any comprehension. Like right now we are sitting here. Like, can we imagine a life in like, you know, Mars? <laughs> Impossible, right? So it's not like I ever imagined what life was going to be in freedom. I just had to go and just find it out. So it wasn't something I was even able to like anticipate. It was just two different universe. Yeah. I mean, do you think in the long term, um, Korean reunification will happen? So the North and the South will, will reunite? That is hard to tell because when I went to South Korea, there was uh, so much discrimination against North Koreans. So Big, and also we are separated for like 75 years. And in modern time, that means a lot of time, right? Yeah. Like 75 years, so we didn't even have internet. Like we didn't have a like smartphone. So can you imagine the, the difference that we took? Like in South Korea, I didn't even know what credit card it was. In North Korea, of course, we don't even have banks. So you were understanding what banking was and what is a like, credit card, de debit card, you know? What is like... Uh, it's just it's so different universe. Therefore, it's going to be very hard. Even if that happens, it's going to be a very painful process for both of Koreans to go through. 
suppose there's, um, I, I, I don't know how much you can answer this. I, t- I totally get it, but you might not be able to. Um, but in terms of, kind of the level of internal opposition within North Korea, I mean, do you think it's something the regime is genuinely worried about or is it still quite a low level? It's not really a threat to them. About the... Um, so sort of in, internal discontent within North Korea. Do you think it's, you know, really a, a threat to the regime or is it more of a, a lower down bubbling, bubbling along thing? So it is really like, like, you know, I will say like, I don't know because that, in North Korea, there's no way you can do the public survey, <laughs> right? Like, are you happy with the public, like, Korean government, right? That happens in you're going to be executed. So it was really feel like living in a, you know, Truman Show in the movie. Like, you, nobody tells you the truth. The first thing my mom told me as a ch- child was, like, not to even whisper because the birds and mice could hear me. And in that scenario, like, even if there is some group might want to overthrow the regime, if we know about it, I'm I'm sure they're not going to succeed in it. So, you know, it is a very different nature of oppression that we are talking about. It's like 1984, George Orwell is like closest I can find. Like, thought is a crime. You can commit a thought crime in North Korea. And and I don't see any parallel like that kind of oppression in this world right now. How do you think the outside world should, should treat North Korea? Um, you know, how, how should Western countries interact with it? I think the Western international community should realize that North Korea is not a joke. It is an actual threat to humanity. That right now, the North Korea's the nuclear capability is really, really threatening to all of us. And if we stopped it like 10 years ago, we didn't even have to come this far. But if we don't stop it for the next 10 years, we then we don't know. We have to be commanded by Kim Jong-un for the rest of our lives because they can like actually blow up anywhere. And it is already in that state. So first realizing what a big threat to all of us. And the second of all is like that to understand North Korea, why North Korea exists. Not because Kim Jong-un is something so great, because Chinese regime is sponsoring it. So understanding the Chinese regime is like so responsible for this problem is I think the main key that we, we like most of people refuse to get it. And it's only recently, I think that, I mean, I don't know, I mean, as much as I hate Trump, he was the only one bringing up all the dangers of Chinese regime to the world. And I think that's why it's nobody's all bad, I guess. <laughs> it's, um, when, you, when you actually, went to China itself. So, cause you went to China from, um, obviously straight from North Korea. Um, I mean, w- were people surprised to meet someone from North Korea in China or is it just a kind of an accepted thing? No, I mean, they were like buying us, they were selling us, they were raping us. They wasn't like, we were being treated like a human. We were like, uh, un- like we were like puppies for them. They, they even like follow us to the bathroom. There's no dignity in it. They're real like a product they just bought. So, you know, they don't have any concept of what human rights is. So it, I don't even, yeah, it's just definitely a different story. Like how we are being treated in China is like, it's indescribable. I'm, I'm, I'm really, really sorry. Um, I mean, just one final question. So you hear a lot about kind of the elites in North Korea. Um, and that they get huge amounts of luxuries, mm-hmm. like yeah, um, that, that kind of smuggled over the border, um, and you know, kind of, I think sex slaves and all sorts of terrible things. Um, to what extent do no, the average North Koreans know about that? Do you think? Do, do they know that you know Kim Jong Un is living a very fancy life with lots of luxurious Western products, or does he keep that quiet and and present a different facade? So when I was in North Korea, I truly genuinely believed that kings were hungry and they were suffering because that was all the propaganda songs we had to sing. Like we had to sing like, dear leader, please get some rest, please take a you know, sleep or eat something. We, we were like, you know, learning that he was uh, starving for us. So that was all propaganda. Of course they don't show like, oh, like I have this older sort of serious life. However, I do know that nowadays a lot of elites in Pyongyang know 
I mean, because themselves are privileged, they know that Kim is, of course, not hungry. But the people in the bottom, we were so, so brainwashed. Like myself, I genuinely believe that kings were, were like starving like us. Well, so, I mean, I'm so, so sorry for what you've been through. You're, you're incredibly brave. Um, I, I really, really hope that some progress is made on the issues you raise. Um, but no, so, so, thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much. It was very lovely talking to you, James.